welcome you all uh, to the uh, 2021 CBC uh, Craft Brewers Conference here in Denver. It's been two and a half years since this industry has been able to get together and uh, it's just really exciting. I, actually, as we were getting set up for the last two days here, you could just sense some excitement in the air. It was pretty cool. Um, my name is Tom Britz. I'm the CEO of Glacier Hops Ranch up in Whitefish, Montana. And I'll be facilitating today. Uh, we've got actually four presenters here. Uh, one of them is home in Burlington, Vermont, so I've got his comments. Uh, pandemic related why he did not attend and uh, the other is at a wedding today and we have him on video so altogether yes there are going to be four pre presenters um, we thought we'd see you in San Antonio last year and we thought we'd see you in San Diego earlier this year so we're just thrilled that we're actually here um, with fingers crossed and masks mostly on um, today's seminar on brewing efficiency the whole point is uh, innovating with both flavor and efficiency to the bottom line. It's all about bottom line. We saw a great deal of innovation and pivoting during the pandemic where there was a greater focus on survival and more attention to the bottom line. And we thought this was a very topical um, conversation to facilitate. The commercial as the sponsor for this uh, uh, session I'd like you to come see us at booth 4526 upstairs <clears throat> on the main expo's floor, but please do stop by the uh, Beer Hospitality Lounge. It's the actually the Glacier Park Beer Hospitality Lounge. Um, and taste and rate, uh, I think there's seven different beers that we're pouring that are infused with hops oil. We're giving away swag every hour, uh, so have some fun over there. Come visit us and visit the uh, hostesses who are going to be uh, uh, over there and meet Miss Rodeo Montana, uh, Kayla Seaman. Uh, she is not only a spokesperson for the Pro Rodeo Circuit of Montana, but she is a spokesperson for the ranching and agriculture industry of Montana. That's very, very important. Montana is known as a uh, malting barley producing uh, area and also now more recently hops. So agriculture and Miss Rodeo Montana is very, very compatible with the craft brewing industry. Um, to jump right into the presentations, I'd like to first introduce our presenters, present and not present, um, some of whom, as I mentioned, couldn't be here. So let's go here. We've got Bill Cherry, the owner of Switchback Brewing in Burlington, Vermont. I've got his comments to share. Uh, Gary Tickle, the CEO of Sustainable Beverage here in Golden, Colorado. Gary. <clears throat> Jerry Sciotti, uh, who is actually at a wedding today. Um, so he is the director of brew house operations down uh, at Lone Tree Brewing Company down by the uh, Park Meadows Mall down in that area. And Todd Malo, he's the COO of Glacier Hops Ranch uh, in, up in Whitefish, Montana. Okay, so this, I asked Bill to comment really just stream of consciousness. What did you do? Why did you do it? What were you trying to achieve? So I'm speaking on uh, behalf of Bill Cherry. These are his words. We make a fantastic IPA that on our best days, we see 25% of it go down the drain, sometimes approaching 33%. It is wonderful to drink, but miserable to make. And for the long term, not sustainable. We have concerns over the high strength waste going down the drain or being diverted and degraded. All things that take us away from brewing and profit. Add to that the fleeting nature of the hop impact on this terrific beer, and we found issues with releasing it in the package. It does great on draft, but the sediment and flavor degradation over time, especially if stored warm, make it a dicey product to sell. With hops oil, we designed our IPA from the ground up. This way we could embrace the wet hop character as a distinctive character for the beer, simply put built into the recipe. We chose to continue to dry hop with pellets, but at a drastically reduced rate with hops oil taking up the slack to give us the big hop punch overall. This means we do not achieve the full efficiency possible, but getting 85% consistently into the final package brings us close to the 90% we expect on our normally hop beers. We find that at day one, freshness, 
we have the grassiness of the pellet still dominating the flavor and aroma. Within three days, that has settled, and we have a remarkable hop intensity. While there will be the usual decline in the pellet hop contribution, it is much less noticeable due to the hop soil character holding strong. So while the grassiness declines, the aromas we most want stay potent throughout our 120-day shelf life and beyond. It is our goal to have a beer that holds its flavor beyond our shelf life as a buffer for poor storage. While we started with traditional hop soil, we have adopted the magic pre-emulsified oil now. The ease of use is well worth it. After our traditional dry hopping with pellets, we transfer to our bright beer tank. In the bright, we have a single recirculating setup that allows us to add the hop soil magic into the beer and recirculate for one hour. We hold the beer in the bright tank overnight. We package the next day, <clears throat> but do like to be sure three days have passed before releasing the beer to the public. Normal shipping tends to take care of that. We find the flavors and aromas balance out during that time. The day one result is raw, kind of like sticking your head into a box of hops. This dies down and the subtleties come out over those first few days. At the end of the day, I am most impressed with the long lasting impact we get with hop soil. I'm spoiled because my samples are always held refrigerated for the whole time, but essentially the flavor and aroma are undiminished for months. So anyway, there you go. Those are Bill Cherry's comments. I thought they were very useful and very, very helpful. So let's go on to our next presenter, Jerry Sciotti. This actually, uh, this is a video that uh, was in a BA collab hour that we took out uh, and it's, it, it really hits the notes that we're talking about here. Uh, trying, testing, evaluating, innovating, what to look for, uh, technical notes, so pay really close attention. He hits on all the notes. So I'd like to bring Jerry up to share his experiences to date, where he's going and what he's learned. Jerry, the floor is yours. Thanks, Tom. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, to speak with you all about this. Um, as Tom mentioned, uh, living in a post-COVID world um, just brings up a whole other set of challenges to overcome. Uh, I can say, however, you know, trying to find more yield in any hop forward beer um, since I started here has, has been a priority. And I think it's kind of a losing attitude to say, well, there's nothing we can do about it. And you know, since I've been here in a lot of our hop forward beers, um, we've ranged anywhere from two to four pounds per barrel, uh, including the dry hop. And, you know, as tastes change, as, as people uh, desire more uh, innovative ways to drink hoppy beers, uh, that only further complicates the matter. So what I can tell you that uh, when we brew, let's say a double IPA or a single IPA, and I know that I'm gonna lose anywhere from 25 to 30% or more coming out of the fermenter of sellable beer, um, it pains me every time. So uh, of course, we're always looking to, to increase that. And over the years, various techniques have um, uh, been implemented to, to create more aroma uh, in the kettle hopping process, more, more flavor. But with that, I think comes some, um, uh, some negative returns as far as as far as loss. So um, we've we've started to uh, creep into the uh, the hop oil um, type of products here, and it's it's been a slow process. But what I can tell you is um, we've seen some really good results. And uh, I don't know about uh, all of all of the brewers out there, but um, a lot of other factors come into play that you may have not thought of in the past. So let's say you're taking um, you know, uh, a dry hopped beer that uh, you want to pull the yeast off, you want to harvest that for another beer. So, of course, that's a temperature based uh, calculation. You want a lot of yeast to fall out um, to, to get a good harvest, but then you also want to dry hop that beer. So uh, dry hopping with T90 pellets uh, has a lot better impact at higher temperatures. So how do you combat that? So there's a lot of things that you start to, to realize uh, are some ancillary um, beneficial aspects of, of incorporating some of these these hop oil products that are out there now, specifically the hop soil. And what I can say uh, in incorporating this is we've 
Uh, we've spoken to others that have used the product and uh, we've uh, decided that the best way to incorporate this uh, is more or less on the, uh, the cold side of things in the bright tanks. And um, we used our, uh, our mug club members as kind of a, a guinea pig, as a blind uh, taste panel. And what we did is we, uh, we brewed a, a double IPA that we normally uh, use for our production. And uh, we wanted to isolate as much as we could to showcase the hops oil. So what we did, we brewed a small batch. Uh, we then uh, did not incorporate a T90 dry hop. Uh, we then sent it to a bright tank. We, we carbonated uh, with the hops oil in, in the bright tank. And then we had the mug club people do a side by side. Uh, we didn't tell them what we did to it. We just put our normal double IPA in there uh, next to the, the hops oil uh, double IPA. And we got some pretty interesting results. I, I was very um, surprised actually how many people uh, preferred uh, the, the hops oil versus our traditional double IPA. It was about a 50-50 split. So um, that, that really struck me. And I think that uh, right there is pretty telling that um, you can you can transform these beers uh, to to a level that you didn't really expect in the beginning, and uh, we're closely tracking the yield gain. Um, and like I said, more experimentation is needed. However, uh, you're going to have to go in and maybe adjust some some recipes if if you're worried about head retention or you're worried about um, um, you know other factors. It may involve a little tweaking here and there but like i said it's it's the scientific process that that you need to be comfortable with and do things slowly and uh like i said always start out on a small scale with this stuff and uh tom's been a great resource over there at glacier to help um walk through what type of varieties do well in certain styles um you know for instance um there's uh, certain varieties that can take on a whole other flavor profile uh, once they go through this this process of, in the hops oil. So that's what I would suggest um, in the beginning is to, you know, try it out on a, on a small keg style basis, uh, dosing kegs. I think the best results in terms of, uh, you know, retaining uh, correct head retention is to uh, carbonate in bright tanks with carbonation stones. Um, I think that's the best way to, um, to, to combat that, um, that fear. But um, like I said, tastes are always changing. Uh, contracting for hops is one of the, the toughest things that I have to do here and to try to figure out what people are gonna demand from, from hoppy beers three years from now is it's incredibly difficult. And like, like Tom was mentioning on a couple of slides before, storage, um, storage fees, um, the, the varieties themselves that you never thought you need to be contracting for, um, that all brings us, uh, you know, makes the job that much harder. So uh, we're trying to get more beer. We're trying to keep the people happy with, uh, with new varieties. But what I would say is, I think, I think this is the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, hoppy beers. And um, as, as tastes change, as, as people um, want, the the juicier fruitier products um i think this is a great way to do that uh, i've heard from other brewers that um incorporating these into seltzers um does very well so whether you like it or not you know uh, those are products that are here to stay i think for a while and the more that you can experiment now and start to compile your data i think um only further helps you make the financial decision down the road because uh you as you know as well as I do, if you're buying hops uh, on contract and um, you're trying to incorporate uh, new new hop oil products, you might not have a home for all those T90 pellets. So you have to be aware of uh, of the sunk cost from that aspect. So um, a lot of different levers are at play here, but um, there's a break even analysis to anything you do in a brewery, I think, and I I, I strongly believe that if you take the time up front. To, to introduce that and to be aware that it's not gonna, it's not gonna be a silver bullet overnight. Um, I think you have to continue to use your, brew, your brewers, use your, uh, your customer base, uh, your sales force um, to uh, see what people think. I mean, it's like I said, the first batch uh, is not gonna be uh, perfect, 
if I had to do it all over again, I probably would have experimented with a, a slightly less hoppy beer than 80 IBUs. So um, these are things you learn as you go. But um, like I said, um, I think these products are here to stay. As Tom mentioned, um, if we continue to just keep hopping beers to a ridiculous level, um, they might taste good in the beginning. But uh, when I try a one month, a three month, a six month uh, QC beer that's been warm stored versus cold stored, it's it's pretty remarkable. Um, it's pretty eye opening that uh, the hop creep thing is a very real problem to deal with. And uh, I think long term, this could be uh, a solution to to combat that. So I think uh, brewers all over uh, can at least experiment on a small scale. And the more money you can eke out of every batch, I don't care if it's a half barrel keg. Um, I think everyone can do the math on what um, a, a double IPA half barrel keg can sell for in your tasting rooms. And right there, that can pay for a lot of costs in other aspects. So once again, uh, the break-even analysis and Tom uh, and everyone over at Glacier have done a very good job of doing a side-by-side -side comparison, a costing worksheet uh, that I think he'll talk about later that um, is pretty eye-opening. So I just encourage everyone to uh, reach out, uh, utilize all those resources, and uh, just be patient. Uh, the, this is an evolving process, and they need a lot of feedback from us because that's the only way they can uh, make the product better. So um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to uh, um, to entertain those. Feel free to reach out. But uh, Tom's been a great resource. And like I said, try it on a small scale um, and and kind of work your way up from there. But I think uh, I think there's some real promise here. So uh, really happy to, to continue using these products. And like I said, um, experiment on other things. It uh, doesn't have to be hop forward beers. It could be uh, lagers that you've wanted to dry hop for a while. Uh, could be used to kind of revitalize beer that's already in serving tanks that, uh, that the hop flavors fallen out a little bit. So I think that this is a little bit more versatile of a product and um, uh, it can, it can dissolve very well into beer and um, there's hazy products out there for it as well. So um, a lot's changing right now, but like I said, uh, this is kind of um, a highly beneficial product to uh, combat uh, the loss, the hop creep, and um, we're, we're really excited to see how it uh, performs on a longer term basis. So, I hope that was uh, very, very helpful and insightful to you. Uh, and once again, Jerry's at a wedding today, uh, but uh, his comments I thought were right spot on about efficiency and innovation uh, and flavor. Um, Next, uh, I would like to introduce you to Gary Tickle. He is the CEO of Sustainable Beverage Technologies. We first met uh, Gary, oh, I don't know, a few months ago, and uh, uh, they don't use hop soil today in any of their commercial products, but I was so fascinated with the uh, efficiency, the story that they've got to tell, that it was perfect, I thought, uh, to listen to this thinking outside of the box approach. Uh, that Sustainable Beverage Technologies has. So, Gary, it's all yours. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to uh, CBC, and thanks, Tom, for the invitation. So, a little bit about SBT. We're all the way up in Golden, Colorado, so we're just down the road, and you can tell um, my accent is not from Denver. It's not even from Golden. Uh, I'm from Australia originally, but part of the SBT team since January this year. And it's a really uh, unique opportunity to, to work in a business where our mission really is to help you uh, to, to change the industry from the inside and offer a different way of thinking about brewing for the future. As Tom mentioned, there's a lot going on in this space as a result of uh, what we've just been through, which is severe disruption, a lot of challenge to businesses. And typically, out of those events always comes the opportunity for those who choose to innovate and change and, and change the paradigm for the future and those who are stuck in the past and many who get left behind in those tough situations. We aim to be part of the solution for the future that is the change of the paradigm and to offer you something that makes you think a little differently about how you might do business in the future using our technology. Uh, the good and the bad news is we're all temporary custodians of the planet. Uh, if you've got family, you've got children, you understand that you're, you're going to pass this on to somebody else. So, while we're in the chair and we've got the, the temporary role, 
it's, I believe, our responsibility to do what's in our power to make change for the good. And in our case, we have a couple of technologies. Up the top, the, uh, the uh, whatever language it is, says we have two technologies. Um, one is Bruvo, which is our uh, fermenting, our uh, patented process where we can produce beer at one sixth tr traditional weight, and uh, we call it multi brew beer. And then the other side of it is the retail side of that, which is the dispensing of the product. So taking it all the way through the supply chain to the, to the customer, having draft beer poured with no kegs in the system. And just imagine your world with no kegs. I'm sure many of you would appreciate not having them. Uh, they're, they're a blessing and a curse. We have to have them today, but they're, they're not necessary in the future if you adopt this technology. So if we move along and just talk a little bit about uh, that, which is uh, multi-brewed beer. Uh, so it's a very unique process. We have a patented brewing process where we can essentially bring the beer down to one-sixth its uh, normal size. Uh, we take the water and the alcohol away, but we leave everything else in the beer. So it's 6x flavor dense, if you like to think of it like that, as a segmented beer. And that's a bulk liquid which is now at your disposal to do many things. We can either, it is, it is at that time it has an ABV of around 3 or a little under 3% in its concentrated form at 6x. So you have the chance to reconstitute that back with water and carbonation and you've instantly got an NA beer that you can can straight away. Uh, or you can reconstitute it and add alcohol back and then you make it session strength or full strength. But if you can imagine it, you've got one base beer that you can do multiple things with uh, as you've brewed it through our process. So that's an interesting start point. Then if you carry that through and say, okay, so that's great. If I could get that all the way to the consumer in that form, that would be fantastic because that would essentially mean I don't have to involve kegs in the process. And that's where next draft comes in. We do have a tap solution. Uh, if you look at the footprint of a typical uh, tap solution we have today for next draft, it's a um, eight tap tower, six is beer, two uh, water taps. And the footprint looks a little bit bigger than this, a standard kegerator. And inside that is six different beers that we can pour and a small backroom package which does the carbonation, carbonation water filtration and chilling. And all of that comes together and pours a beer on tap live. But instead of having to bring uh, six kegs to the table, you've literally got a footprint slightly bigger than this, which has your six beers in it. And you have the benefit, of course, because it's a bag and box process of the change outs being much easier than having to, to manage a keg. So if you think of that upstream and say, well, what does that mean for kegs? Well, on a typical pallet, you can fit um, the equivalent of 124 gallons right, in, in a keg format. In our case, 120 bag and boxes uh, go on a pallet, and that equates to 720 gallons worth of consumable product when it's reconstituted. So you think straight away you've got about 5.8 times more on a pallet than you could with kegs. And the other benefit is there's no kegs that need to go back. Right? There's no reverse logistics. You're not shipping air and stainless steel back to the factory to be, to be uh, uh, reclaimed and re recleaned, and in many cases just to be found, because they have something like 5% loss of kegs in any given year as well. It's one way. So if you think of that through the distribution network today and what that means for just getting product into the retail trade, there's massive efficiencies to be had, both in terms of long haul transport and also just the retail transport of getting it into the physical facility. Now, Bruvo itself provides many different options and that, that's the, the advantage of the technology is you start on that left hand tank, which is a 6x dense uh, flavor beer, and then you can take it along the top path, you can mix it in a bright tank, and you can take it all the way through to carbonation and packaging straight away in cans. In the middle form, we put it into bag and box. They're one gal gallon bags. If you hold a one gallon bag in your hand, you're holding the equivalent of 48 pints of beer right there in your hand. And those bag and boxes have the added flexibility of um, you can take them through to the supply chain and pour them on next draft. But we today freeze those bag and box. We have in our uh, tap system up in Golden, we've been pouring beers that were made over a year ago. And we put them to sleep, we woke them up, we put it on the tap and they taste great. So again, if you think about the ultimate flexibility of that model, you've got a lot of options around how you use that, that bulk beer that you make. Separately, you can truck it across the country or across the world and say, okay, I want my beer to be shipped to the East Coast in its bulk form. 
sent to a co-packer, they carbonate it and can it, and suddenly I've now got my beer on the East Coast for the first time, and I haven't had to ship any water, any cans, or any kegs. I've done it all in situ in the local market. So as a market access tool, it's another way of thinking about how you can approach new markets for the first time using this technology. So lots of different ways to think about it. And most importantly for me uh, is the consumer, right? Because if we roll, if the next slide will roll forward, yeah. So this says, believe it or not, sustainability needs to satisfy the consumer. At the end of the day, technology is a great thing and we can all make fancy new toys that we can play with in, in our production facilities. But in the end, it's all about the beer, right? We want the consumer to love the end product. And I have to say, you know, working with Tom's team, um, Hopsoil is one of those innovative tools that we can bring to the table in addition to the work we're doing to supplement how we get to that final uh, world-class product. And I say world-class not lightly because uh, in the case of our beers, the very first beer competition we ended into is the Ben Best of Craft Beer Competition in 2019 as an NA beer. And uh, the feedback was not many people uh, really entered the NA beer category, so do you want to drop out or would you like to stay in and we'll throw you in with the session beers so you can get some feedback. So I said, okay, we'll, we'll go to the session beers and see what we get. Well, what we got was a gold medal, actually. Um, we beat all the session beers <laughs> and we're the NA beer using this technology. Uh, subsequent to that, um, we make for Deschutes uh, an Irish dark stout beer today, uh, which is on the market as an NA beer. They've entered it into three international beer competitions and uh, we just had our third one yesterday, which is the US Open uh, beer competition. And in all three competitions, they've won either gold, silver or bronze for that beer. So I'm, I'm really uh, excited about the fact that the technology is delivering what we expect and that is a great beer to the end consumer. So the proof point here is with all of these innovations, whether it's through hops oil, doing something different in how we get the, the aromas and the flavor additions, how we get the technology to take water and alcohol out of the equation and re-add them when we want to, you don't have to give up on the end product to the consumer and that matters a lot, right? You can actually move the ball forward. It's not a compromise. So just a couple of numbers that is, I think, interesting to think about is we just sent, we did a, a rough estimate based on a 200,000 barrel brewery, which is what this is related to. And if you took kegs out of that network and used our technology, we would expect annualized savings in the order of about $200,000 a year in labor, up to $100,000 in truck journeys. That's probably going up by the day, actually, that number, because it's all bad news. There's not much good on that front. And of course, just the kegs themselves, the cost of the kegs. And if you then flip it forward and say, well, what does that mean from the environment perspective? Um, we also have real savings here, which are annualized savings in terms of the CO2 emissions that are reduced. 62 metric tons of CO2 from the truck journeys, 37 metric tons just from the stainless steel you don't need for the kegs that you're not using anymore. And that equates to something like 472 acres of uh, rainforest, you'd have to ha offset that every single year that you're manufacturing, and that's just one brewery. So you start to multiply that by the number of breweries we have in the world today, these are astronomical numbers. And the most important thing is at no time have we compromised on the consumer and the beer they get, uh, which is the key. So you know, I think it's food for thought for all of you about where we would like to take the industry. People like Tom are uh, innovating in terms of all of the flavor profiles and, and the additions that we can bring to the beers. We're bringing new technology and new thinking on how you make the beer and how you transport it. And most importantly, the winner is the consumer and the planet. And uh, hopefully we get to work with some of you down the line. Thanks very much. Thanks, Gary. Um, it is fascinating technology. Uh, I'll have some questions during myself for Gary during the Q&A. Uh, be thinking about uh, questions. We will have ample time for Q&A when we're done. So definitely um, any question is a fair question. So next is, uh, uh, we've got a little video. Yes, a little video as we prepare to introduce Todd Melo. We are at the Scott Hop Yard near Whitefish, and uh, Randy and his family have been growing hops for, this is probably their fifth year. They're growing Cascade, Centennial, 
and a proprietary Montana variety that we call Aroma, which is kind of like a pina colada, tropical fruit kind of uh, aroma. This one here that I just smelled, this is Cascade. It's very citrusy, uh, kind of a, almost a, oh, fresh grapefruit that's sweet, almost like a ruby red grapefruit. It's really awesome. And these are probably two weeks away from harvest, and so the, the aroma is very, very good. And um, uh, we're going to be putting all of this into hops oil, which is our proprietary essential oil that we use for brewers, uh, and this may get shipped around the world. Oh, wow, these are just about ripe. They're fantastic smelling. The yellow stuff that you see in there is actually called lupulin resin, and that's where all the magic happens in hops. Uh, there's probably, they say as many as a thousand different chemical compounds that are contained in this lupulin resin. Probably the most used and most famous are the alpha acids that create bittering for beer, the beta acids that produce the preservative action, and the uh, fantastic oils that give it the smell. So the oils are comprised of terpenes, and that is what we capture uh, through steam distillation at harvest time that is used in hop forward beers primarily to add a real punch so that you can get a fresh hopped a seasonal on a year round basis. And that's, that's what we first fell in love with when we started doing this. And you can't get away from that, that fantastic fresh wow that you get. Uh, boy, this smells good. I wish you could smell it. We're located in the heart of Whitefish, Montana with the Big Mountain Ski Resort shadowing over us and with Glacier National Park in our backyard. Well, this is a pure essential oil, and it's gonna float on top. And so therefore, you get a big aroma boost, but you don't get much taste. And you'll get inconsistency in a beer or a cider or any other beverage with just the pure essential oil. This is our hazy hop soil, and this is turned into a water-soluble emulsion. And look at that go to the bottom. Drop, two drops. If I were to leave this here, because of how the electrons are all positively charged, it will eventually self-suspend and distribute by itself. Otherwise, if you were just to carbonate this, uh, that's all of the agitation that you need to give yourself a wonderful hazy beverage that will stay in suspension for 12 to 16 months or longer. I can smell it from here. We have another version of our hop soil that we call Magic. Now this is different, this is much more concentrated. All I'm doing is I'm putting a wet toothpick in there, and if this was pure oil, it would mostly float on the top. But this is actually going into the water so that it not only has both aroma, but it has flavor. A little bit of this oil goes a long, long ways. I've been a commercial brewer for 14 years, and when I had the opportunity to meet with Tom, he did the test for me, and uh, the wonderful aroma test, it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. It was because of that taste test that got me interested and here to be a part of his great company. I'm super excited. As a brewer, this stuff is the stuff, man. I'm telling you, it's great. Cheers. So Todd is our COO. He's uh, got 14 years of commercial brewing experience in Minnesota and Montana. Uh, he's uh, uh, trained as a chemist, um, actually right here at Colorado State University up the road. Uh, he was the former CEO of an herbal supplement uh, company uh, in uh, Montana. And so I'll turn it over to Todd. Come on up. Dang, my laptop's big. All right, here we go. All right, good morning, everyone. As demonstrated by our other panelists, um, we know that efficiency is a must, especially during this COVID and post-COVID world. I, uh, I'm kind of a storyteller, so bear with me. I do have a point, but I want to tell that story first. Um, I believe it was in 2001. Uh, yes, it was, because I just turned 30. Holy crap, my old. Uh, and it was June, it was at the MBAA meeting in St. Paul, Minnesota. 
and I was a, my first year brewing for Manville Brewing Company, a very, very small brewing company in southern, southeastern Minnesota. And it was my first meeting. I was excited to see all these master brewers there, and I was just like, I was ready to learn. And right before the meeting started, an older gentleman in his 70s came down and sat right beside me. And you know, I didn't think anything of it. He introduced himself as Zig, the uh, uh, former brewer of Jacob Schmidt Brewing Company, which was also known as the St. Paul Brewing Company. And he'd been brewing for 50 years, at least. That's for sure what I know. And uh, we had a chance to chit chat. We chatted about a few things and meeting started. And after a few speakers, there was a little break and he, and he turned to me and he looks and he goes, most of these guys, they think they know everything about the brewery. They don't. I've been brewing for 50 years and I can tell you, sorry, I, gotta, I have my quote here. I can tell you, I am still learning. And then he looked me straight in the eye. He goes, you wanna be a good brewer? You gotta know two things. Clean, clean, clean. <laughs> and when you think you've done cleaning, clean again. Of course, that's, all of us know that, right? Mm, six in our mind. But the other thing he told me, he goes, and number two, don't be like these guys. Keep your eyes open. Always be willing to learn. I'm gonna tell you one other thing. Remember this statement. You know enough to understand you know nothing. I know enough to understand I know nothing. <laughs> that's actually a really great statement. It really made me think a lot about this whole industry and what I was about to learn. And I took, you can take it several different ways, but the way I took it as, there's always something new that's gonna happen. There's always something new that I need to learn and to master, no matter how long. This gentleman was doing it for 50 years and he was still in a master brewer's meeting. He was still learning. He was still going to the brewery just because he wanted to learn. He was going to other breweries to see what they were doing just because he wanted to learn. I mean. If that's not dedication to your craft, I don't know what is. And it was a great person for me to learn on my very first day. And so I thought I'd just share that experience with you guys. But it definitely ties into our talk today. When I first met Tom, as he said, I was the CEO of a herbal supplement company. And he came there because we did uh, export, we exported to countries all over the world. And he had some product that he wanted to send out. And he wasn't at the point where he could do it himself. And, and so he asked us to help. And of course, me being the nosy CEO that I was, I go, so what, what, what is this product that you're sending out? And he goes, well, it's hops oil. I stopped in my tracks. I looked at him. And I was no longer CEO. I was brewer. What do you mean hops oil? And he's like, well, yeah, it's uh, steamed as fresh hops, steamed as still, hops oil that we add to beer instead of dry hopping. And I go, no shit. Oh, sh sorry. And then I'm like, more professional. And he's like, no, really, it's, that's what it's for. I'm like, well, I need to find out more about this. So we sat down and we started chatting. He started telling me about his history. And I was getting more and more excited the more he talked. And as you guys know, dry hopping has been used since the classic IPAs of old. Since they opened up the casks, add the dry hops to the beer, close it, and then shift it off to India. And so ever since then, as brewers, we've been fighting the same battle, the loss of volume in the finished product. The challenge is, of course, to minimize, um, to minimize or even fully replace dry hopping, but yet maintain flavor, our sensory notes, and maintain the mouthfeel that dry hopping gets. Tom tells me, well, our product can do both. It was at that point, I knew I was in, ended up leaving that job, joining Tom, and I've been happy ever, ever, ever since. A product like hops oil should really excite a brewer. Not only do we have to, we don't have to mess around with pounds and pounds of hops. You don't have to wait five to seven days for that to steep, then pull the true, and then carbonate, and then package. With hops oil, the volume is increased. Your uh, turnaround time is several days faster. It takes about, once the product is added, anywhere between 12 to 24 hours for the product to bloom. Um, you usually during, do add it during the carbonation process or as you're passing it to the bright tank. You'll be able to carbonate, 
and package within 24 hours. I mean, that really is saving a lot of time, not only in for your dry hops, but also just efficiency. At Glacier Hops Ranch, we have a, product, uh, a sheet called the costing worksheet, and I believe uh, Jerry mentioned that in his slide. Basically what we do is we take all your expenses, put it in there, and break it down from dry, from your, all the way from the very beginning to dry hopping to the very end. And then we take out your dry hops and we put in hops oil. And you can see the exact savings that you're getting and show the increased profitability of your, of your product, of that beer alone. Not just all your beers, but of that beer alone. And it's actually pretty eye-opening. I wanna make sure I note this. We're innovators in this, specifically in the hop soil area. While we've had a lot of success, we've also had bumps in the road. This is still a really, really new product. And we know that it survives fermentation, it survives centrifugation, but I actually am just dealing with something right now. I don't know how it's gonna act with clarification. Uh, there's there's a, a brewer that's gonna add silicon dioxide to help pull everything out to help clarify his beer. I don't know exactly if that's gonna you know, work with the hop soil. We're, so we're really still new. We're still trying to figure everything out. But it's because of that, uh, I really appreciate Tom for this. I have a chance to put in an experimental brewery inside our office. It's a one barrel system. We're all about to sit down and do all the experimentation that I need to help you brewers with our product. Um, I'll be able to uh, uh, brew one barrel batch, split it off into five different uh, vessels. And I can test dosing rates. I can test different filtration methods. I can start testing varieties of hop soil versus varieties of yeast. What works? What doesn't work? What are the flavors? What are these off flavors? And so we're trying to be ahead of the game because we know that you guys have so many questions. And here's the thing, you guys use so many different products. I'm an old school brewer. My first brewery was a milk house brewery. And I don't know if any of you guys really know that. They took milk vault tanks and made mash tune, whirlpool, and sometimes even fermenters out of these things. And that's how I first started brewing. And so what we use then, what we used was being used now. There's so many other products out there that you guys use to help your yeast grow and everything like that. It's really hard to find, you know, in a short amount of time, what our product can do to help everybody. And that's why we're putting in this research brewery. Let's see, sorry. So I know that's fairly fast, because uh, I talk really fast, sorry, Tom, um, nervousness. But I just want to say in closing, you know, the innovations are needed today in this new world to increase efficiency and profitability. Otherwise, we won't survive. Um, we don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. And so what we can do today to help our bottom line is a must. We on this panel are leading the charge. We know others will follow suit. So that's why we need to have the best quality and have premier customer service. And we will continue to lead the charge. Thank you. Thanks, Todd. Um, We've got some time now for q and A. I'm gonna start, I have one question for Gary. Um, so you used an example of uh, a 200,000 barrel a year brewery. Well, what about small breweries? How does this apply to a small, say a thousand barrel a year, 5,000 barrel a year brewery? Oh, you can just. Yeah, I think it's a it's an interesting question. Obviously, the um, the economics translate at any level because it all comes down to the fact that you all have to use the same method of distribution, and that is, if you're going to draft or trying to access draft, you have to use kegs. So there, there's still a direct translation to a smaller scale brewery. Um, it would just mean you're using a smaller scale operation to actually do the manufacturing with the Bruvo system that we would implement. But ultimately, if you're trying to access new markets, I think of it in the other direction saying, if I'm only 1,000 barrels, and that's partly because if I can only distribute in the 300 mile radius, because that's where I can make money, the logical question is, how big could I be if I had a technology that would give me the economies of scale that the big guys have, and I could access new markets? So I actually think of it as a flip and saying, yeah, you'll get the economies, but more importantly, what can you do with them to ultimately access markets that maybe today are just beyond you, being a small guy? 
Thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir. Hello. I was just curious uh, what the difference is as far as uh, compounds and whatnot that you're getting from the steam distillation versus something like a CO2 extraction. Um, yeah. So the, that's really a good question. So uh, the way we, first of all, we're starting with a different raw ingredient. CO2 extraction usually uh, starts with a dried either pellets or whole leaf. And so the beauty of that is that you can do that on a year-round basis because the hops have been preserved. Uh, the big difference with hop soil is that it is only uh, made from fresh hops at harvest time. There's a good and bad. We get the, all of the terpenes out of that, the oils out of that. But in that extraction process where we take fresh hops literally out of the field, that's why they smell so darn good, <clears throat> and then extract that oil, we capture all of that, all of it, all the most volatile things. If, if anybody in this room ever been to a, a hop farm during harvest time? It smells awfully good, doesn't it? That's because during the drying process, if you figure uh, you're, you're drying at 125 to 160 degrees roughly Fahrenheit uh, for five to nine hours, you're burning off the uh, oils that have the lowest, most volatile uh, uh, flash point, the lowest flash point. And so <coughs> the difference is we capture that. In, in pellets, that's, that's what you have to do. You have to dry the hops to preserve them. But in this, we capture all of those. So what we don't capture that is captured in CO2 are all of the alpha acids and all the beta acids. So this is a pure uh, um, oil. It's a pure aroma. Uh, add, not a bittering add whatsoever. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, other questions? No vegetal characters in your oils? No, not really, no. Uh -uh. Surprising. Yeah, yeah, it's literally just oil. We, we did a, um, we typically Friday afternoons, we do a sensory uh, analysis of where we dose beers, and, and we usually use, uh, we used to use Coors Light, uh, found out it actually was a little bit too flavorful, so we switched to Bud Light, and it's perfect as a base for what we're doing. I, I mean, I, I love Anheuser-Busch, don't get me wrong. Um, but uh, it's a really good base beer for us, and Todd wasn't there that day, and so some of the gals uh, went rogue, and they went, you, you guys tripled the dosage for what we were uh, trying to do. And one of the, one of the blends that Todd uh, referred to, Ambrosia, which is really a nice, kind of a fruit basket kind of a, a blend. Um, and uh, in that, it, was, it hit me in the face like nectarine and strawberry. It was so different. So when he's talking about different dosing rates, what we, like for instance, this, this seltzer, just to kind of showcase what it did, uh, there's nothing, there's no yeast, there's, uh, there's no malt in that to add flavor to it. So the dosage rate on that, when we sat down with the brewers uh, at Lewis and Clark Brewing, to try to figure out how to do it. We started with what we thought our base was, uh, an equivalence of five milliliters per barrel. And we went all the way up and kept ramping up until we got too high to where it was like, that's, that's not, and we all reacted the same way. And so we backed it back down because we wanted to showcase that variety. This is one of our proprietary varieties, Aroma, that I mentioned in the video. Um, <coughs> and it's, uh, it really does, so we've learned not only can you vary it by, uh, flavor profile, but then the, um, the dosing rate gives a totally different dimension depending on what you're trying to do. So we've, we've got breweries down in South, South America, down in Brazil, that are using it as a top note for a, a lager just to make their lager have a little bit of, a, of an aftertaste that is different to separate them from all the other lagers. Answer your question? More questions? Yes, sir. Oh yeah, yeah. So the toothpick trial, I think in our, um, in our world, that's just a demonstration of how it can change water or beer, how it can impact something. It's far from um, exact and it's far from um, uh, accurate. Uh, in most cases, it's actually overdosing. Um, so 
you know, that's just really to kind of get an idea of what the flavor profiles are with the beverage that you're trying to do. A lot of times we've got brewers who will take a base beer like a pale ale and they'll lay a bunch of them out there uh, and then try different varieties. And so out of one batch of beer, they can do multiple d different varieties and different dosage rates. Another thing that we're able to do is we're able to do custom blends. We've, that's really become a big deal. And, and something else that Jerry Sayote mentioned, um, the, uh, like the, the serving tanks that go bad. We typically, probably more than once a month, we get an emergency call. I got nothing out of my tank, can you help me? So we come to the rescue and we figure out uh, after talking to Todd what kind of variety or blend or custom blend is the best based on what they're trying to do, overnight it and we save the batch. Other questions? Thank you so much for your attention. Go test these beers over at the Glacier Park Beer Hospitality Lounge. <laughs>